Hello and welcome to The Real News Network. I'm your host and climate correspondent for The Real News, Aman Azhar. My guest today has seen it all. He's an insider to Washington politics, the world of corporate finance, an advocate of climate action, and dropped out of the US presidential race as well in early 2020. Tom Stair, welcome to The Real News. Aman, thank you for having me. Now, sir, uh, let me open this interview by asking you campaigning for the Democratic uh, presidential ca candidate, of course, uh, Joe Biden, but progressives have voiced concerns on Biden supporting fracking, a continuation of the Obama years. Now, there are major climate concerns regarding uh, methane emissions. Does this support for fracking concern you? Do you think it should be opposed if Biden is, uh, becomes a president? Well, if you look at the Biden plan, it's actually a very aggressive plan. I, th I think it's appropriate. We have to be aggressive at this point in terms of combating climate change. But one of the signature parts of that plan is 100% clean electricity generation by 2035. So if you think about what that means in terms of the timing for the United States, and if you look, even in my home state of California, which has been you know, leading the way in terms of renewable portfolio standards. We didn't have a 2035 date. So as you look about how the schedule that the Biden plan has us moving off fossil fuels, it is really aggressive. So do I understand that there are real issues with fracking? Yes, of course I do. But I think if you look at the Biden plan, including the $2 trillion up front in the first four years, to rebuild infrastructure, build clean infrastructure around the country. If you look at 100% you know, uh, greenhouse gas neutral by 2050 economy-wide, and you look at the, you know, the time when we're gonna have 100% clean electricity generation, I think it answers the questions in a big way. And I think that that's appropriate. And I know that Joe Biden deeply cares about this because I've talked to him about it multiple times. I know that he's very knowledgeable about it. And so I think that the plan itself is a good answer for the question. They could have phrased it in terms of transitioning the way you were explaining it, but they didn't. They said clearly that they're just going to oppose it. So which makes one kind of confused, so kind of confusing whether they're Democrats or Republican, because you can't tell who's trying to frack more. <laughs> well, I'll say this. There is a gigantic chasm between what Joe Biden represents, how he cares about climate, and Donald Trump, who we've heard repeatedly both Donald Trump and Mike Pence in these debates refuse to answer any question about energy or climate in any meaningful way. And, you know, I think the key question here is, does he understand not just that we need to address the climate crisis? Because Look, you wouldn't be asking these questions the way you are if you absolutely didn't know how urgent it was. But that is almost a way of thinking about it vertically. I think the best thing about the Biden plan is that he understands we can't, we can't just attack climate. This is a hugely economic issue that goes throughout our society in the deepest way. So his plan, when you spend $2 trillion in four years, you create millions of good paying jobs. And Joe Biden really relates to this through the idea of those jobs and the union workers who need them and the families that need to a decent middle class living wage. But he also relates to it in terms of the implied question that you're asking him on, which is this. He sees policy through people and he knows that if we're going to have a climate plan, it also inherently has to address pollution that it has to redress environmental injustice. It has to address air pollution, water pollution, and toxicity throughout America, but particularly in underserved black and brown right. communities. So the issue that you're bringing up, which is inherently pollution, the, the impact on people's health of fossil fuels and the use of fossil fuels is something that Biden really gets and right. really cares about. And you know that's why if you look at the plan, 40% of the jobs are aimed at those underserved communities. So let me ask you this then. Go uh, ahead. Let's, let's take the Green New Deal, which uh, both parties have distanced themselves from. 
Green New Deal, which also ties into 2018 UN um, report, which says that we have until 2030 to do a serious reversal of climate change. Do you think a, a Green New Deal is necessary? It's green. It's new. <laughs> Look, the point of the Green New Deal, which I thought was a huge step forward, was to do exactly what I was just trying to describe them on, was to say, you don't do climate in a vacuum. You know, you do climate in the context of the economy and the world we're in. You do climate as a way to address unemployment and jobs and the, the need for better pay and stronger unions. You do it as a way of addressing pollution. And what we're seeing, look, the, the Green New Deal is the government setting up a framework. And, 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 you know, that was just, it really was an idea. It's an idea about coming in with a broad-based approach to climate, which is exactly what the Biden plan does. And let me say something else. There is a sense, you know, the Green New Deal was a couple of years ago. And what we're seeing is that the market the the private sector, whether they're anticipating a Biden-Harris victory or not, is now coming through. I see it every single week in major ways. The private sector in the United States and around the world basically blessing the need for a huge investment in clean energy around the world. And you see, you know, JP Morgan, JP Morgan probably did more lending in frontier energy areas than any other bank in the world. And they last week they said they're going to lend according to the Paris Accord, their whole loan book. The Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank said they were going to lend a trillion dollars to their clients in the next decade to move to net zero. I, I understand the point. Um, the point that I'm laying this out is because the rest of the civilized world or, or, or the Western world, especially Europe, I'm referring to, they're actually aligning their politics according to the Green New Deal, which is closely tying into Paris agreements and other kind of uh, instruments that we have to watch where we are headed in terms of climate change. But but the phrasing, Tom, matters when you say that you're not going to adhere to fracking, oh, you're not going to adhere know. to things like that. You You send out a message, clear one. We are in an urgent crisis. You know, I, I quit my job eight years ago because we are in an urgent crisis and it didn't make sense to me not to be focused on solving something that I thought would endanger the safety and lives of people all over the world. And by the way, literally all over the world. And so when I talk about climate, I'm not coming at this from the point of, you know, there, there's some things in politics that people fight over really, really hard. And there might be a raw, right and a wrong answer, but I don't think there's God in the distinction between a 36 and a 39% tax rate. It's like, there might be a right answer, but, you know, it's not something that's going to shape the world in a hundred years. People are going to say, man, Amon was for 36. Is that crazy? It was 39 was right. But this, this is something where we're looking at an impact on every person in the world, every single American citizen, we're looking at something that can grossly damage health, endanger lives, destroy our economy, and cause strife all over the world. And so not, I, I see it. And you know, I'm sure you read the same scientific reports that I read to try and keep abreast of how we're doing. So I am very, very focused. I live in California. I mean, we're not imagining the climate crisis. We're not projecting the climate crisis. We are living the climate crisis right now, as are many other parts of this country and many other parts of this world. And there are going to be a lot more. So believe me, I understand the importance of language. But And I want to say one other thing. I think it's really important that people understand the crisis we're in, the urgency, the necessity. But I think it's also important for people to understand that we have the tools to right. deal with this. We, the technology, like the world is changing faster. The natural world is deteriorating faster than people predicted. And there was a story that I literally read this morning talking about what's happening in the Arctic and how much faster it's happening than anyone would have predicted and what the ramifications are, which are big. Right. At the so, same time, the technologies ahead, if you'd asked people two years ago, would this be what clean energy costs? Is this what the products would be at? Is this where electric vehicles would be at? They would have said no. 
we're we're doing much better on the technology than people expected at the same time that the threat has magnified and escalated faster than anyone would have expected. Right. Let me ask you then, um, in terms, if you could list like three top priorities uh, that Biden administration should demonstrate in the first few weeks or month if he becomes the president, maybe as part of a COVID-19 econo- economic recovery package, maybe? What they would be. Well, let me say this. If I were going to do three things, probably the first thing, I, I know that this is symbolic, but I, and I know that Joe Biden has said he will do it on day one. I think that rejoining Paris is a huge symbol of where we are. And as you said, words and symbolism matter. Second of all, I would pass the Build Back Better plan to spend the money to set up the, the, the goals as a way of saying, just as you did by joining Paris to the world, we're absolutely committed to this. We're going to spend $2 trillion. We're going to be on this very aggressive timetable. We are committed to doing our part to getting to net zero by 2050 and also to developing the products and the businesses and the industries and the technology that we can share with the rest of the world so you can do it with us. And then the third thing would be this, to set out openly and globally to go back first, I think probably on a bilateral basis was the way it worked in 2015 with Paris, but ultimately aiming for another COP, probably the one in Glasgow in November of 2021 to say, we have to renew, step up, improve Paris and take it to a new level with the United States playing a central role. We're back to being the trusted partners we're back to being leaders. We're going to use trade. We're going to develop fast manufacturing and technology to share with the world so we can all do this together so that people around the world can have cheaper, cleaner energy and the products that that supports. And that's, you know, if we, were, if we did those three things, I would feel like we had taken the first critical step to getting ourselves. And, you know, this is an 86% not American problem. So right. we, we, you know, we, we can't sit here and go like our skirts are clean. Good luck, everybody. We have to say we're in it together and we, we need to be sharing together and working together to make it happen because this isn't like air pollution that's localized. This is air pollution that's global, that has global ramifications and that will hurt people all over the world. And just as in the United States, the most vulnerable will be hurt the most around the world, the most vulnerable will be hurt the most. Right. Um, Tom, let's uh, shift focus a little bit towards California, of course. Now, you're the co-chair of uh, Governor Newsom's uh, Task Force on Business Jobs Recovery. Now, it's been reported that that task force also has a fossil fuel executive as a member, though she recently retired. um, And I'm talking about CEO of uh, Ira Energy, co-owned by Shell and Exxon Mobil. And that company got 36 fracking permits, which has been reported that, and that the company has close connections uh, with the governor. Um, do you have a take on that? You know, I really don't, Amon, because I, unfortunately, those, none of those things were put in front of the task force. Um, as you said, she's left the task force. And so, we, you know, that wasn't something we were ever consulted on or where we had any input. What I do know, the place where I have been actually having input and where I have pushed is to get is to go, get the you know to encourage the governor because we're advisory to encourage the governor to do the ban on internal combustion engine driven vehicles, the sales of internal combustion driven vehicles after 2035, which I think was a very powerful statement. He's sure done a, a couple other very important, um, really climate and environment re- related things subsequent to the fires, including committing to 30% you know, protected land in the state by 2030. And there's a lot of ways to talk about that. But actually, the governor has taken several, including buffer zones around drilling. And, and he's actually is going, has said he would ask the legislature, because he believes it has to be legislative for a ban on fracking starting in 2024. 
But so, so there has been a, re, you know, the things that I have been associated with, I think Governor Newsom has stepped up in a really powerful and leading way on some of the issues that are, you know, 50% of California's greenhouse gas emissions are either from transportation or from the extraction of fossil fuels for transportation. Right. But, you know, so actually what we've seen, and this has been really in the last month or so subsequent to our historic and, you know, devastating fire season, which by the way, isn't over. Yes. I've been actually getting back to the California tradition of having some of the most progressive, aggressive energy and climate laws in the world. Right. Well, let me come at this problem from another angle. Uh, should the fossil fuel industry be at the table in a task force like this, given the climate challenges of the state that you've just recounted, of course? Well, you know, look, my, my experience, look, I was in business for 30 years. I went to Stanford Business School. I understand, I hope, the private sector fairly well. And my attitude about business people is pretty simple, which is, they're by and large decent people and they have a job and their job is to make money for their shareholders. And so, you know, do I think that doesn't make them decent people? No, but I understand that they're advocating for a position. And so am I interested in hearing what business people have to say about their businesses? 100%. They know more about it than anyone else. I'm happy to listen. Do I ever for one single second, Amon, forget the fact that they're advocates who are be, whose livelihoods and success and ambition and own sense of integrity is based on performing to their uttermost the task which, which they're set out to accomplish and for which they're being paid. I never forget it for a second. So, you know, right. if you said to me, would I sit down with the head of the Exxon Mobil Corporation to understand where he's coming from, to understand his plans? I'd love to. Does that mean all of a sudden... I, I'm in favor of what the, Ex, the Exxon Mobil Corporation's opinions are about fossil fuels, climate, or where we're going. Absolutely not. Sure, because my question really was if they should be represented on the task force, which kind of is closely aligned to the policy making, and of course the influence is set in. Well, I can tell you that my experience. This is a jobs and business recovery task force. We have an awful lot of very senior you know, corporate leaders. We also have 15 labor union presidents. So I think we've got a broad array of people in terms of economic advice. And as I said to you, you know, my experience with business people broadly, not just fossil fuel people, is that they view their job as making money for their shareholders and they view themselves, whether they know it or not, they are advocates for their position. And when I talk to somebody from an oil and gas company, I'm happy to listen, but I never, ever, ever for one single second forget that fact. Right. And which is which brings me to one more issue when it comes to California. And that's like uh, California's environmental justice movement's demand, uh, which is for a, for a setback on oil drilling of 2,500 feet from homes, schools, play, playgrounds, and medical facilities. Uh, do you support a, a setback of 2,500 feet? Uh, and is it something that you'd advocate well, to Lamont, Governor Newsom? One of the things which I, I think I just said to you, I was describing it as a buffer zone. The, Governor Newsom said subsequent to these fires is that there will be a buffer zone. I don't think I don't think that he's determined the exact number of feet, 2,500, 500, 1,000, whatever. And I've seen all of the above recommended. But he came out and said, we're going to have buffer zones, which we have not had in the past, around oil drilling sites uh, throughout the state of California which was something that people had been advocating for, as you say, very specifically. And do I think that's appropriate? Of course I know it's appropriate. I mean, I've toured every one of those drilling sites. I went down. You know, there are places where people are drilling oil and then there's a big wall, often covered with ivy or trees or something so you can't see it. And then there's a school. Could that be appropriate? No. Look, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I was saying to you, when you think about environmental injustice. You know, we use all of these fancy terms. Environmental injustice is called, is actually poison. Sick people, people who die very early as a result of activities in their neighborhood, 
that either give them some form of respiratory sickness or where they're actually ingesting toxins in the inside of their body where it doesn't even have to do with breathing, where it has to do with their innards. And if you have friends, which I have many who've been in that situation and you see how it's happened and you see that it's not a coincidence, it's not unintended, it's aware, people are aware, that's the definition of injustice. Right. And so I've never run. I've been running public campaigns on climate for 10 years. 10 years ago, we were talking about clean air and clean water in underserved black and brown communities. We were recruiting leadership for the campaign from those communities. If you look at California's very progressive energy laws, which go back to the 1970s, while I've been involved in the last 10 or 12 years, the leadership has come from the poorest zip codes in this state. People right. have absolutely, you know, when I talked to Kevin DeLeon 10 years ago about climate and clean energy, he said, Tom, if you put solar panels on the roofs of the houses of my constituents, the houses will fall down. Now, let's talk about my constituents getting some of these jobs, putting up the solar panels on other people's houses. Right. Right. So, look, I, there, there, you talk about buffer zones. Of course, you know, there is an issue here. So you would you would problem. lend your support to that kind of there demand of 2,500? No, what I think saying? what I'm saying is this. There have to be buffer zones. And, I, you know, the question is, is there a, any magic number? No. I don't think Fair the enough. governors come out with a magic number. But do there have to be buffer zones? Yes. Fair this enough. This is something Fair that we've seen all around the country. We know that. Okay, well, it's, let me then cover more ground and, and kind of go on, Amon. Let me have it. <laughs> scope a little bit more, uh, which is about the Supreme Court nominee, um, Amy Coney Barrett. And she said yesterday that uh, she doesn't have an opinion on climate change. That's climate denialism. Uh, where, how does that bend the arc of environmental justice in this country, uh, Tom? What, what's going to happen? You know, Amon, you seem like such a nice, trusting person. Do you think there's anyone in the United States who really doesn't have an opinion on climate change? So she's being interviewed to get to, to be confirmed as a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States for life. And on a question about the future safety and health of every American, which actually is a lay down case. There aren't two sides to this story. There is one side, and there's a side that refuses to talk about it. And what you just said to me, I was teasing you about being such a nice, trusting person. If you refuse to talk about it, there's a reason. And the reason is you don't think people are going to like what you have to say. Right. And do you feel that's going to bend the arc of environmental justice movement in this country? Look, it's very threatening to me. And it should be threatening to every single American citizen who values life and health, which should be all of us. We, you know, if you if you care about yourself, if you care about anyone else in this country, you should care about this. And does it scare me to think that there are justices in the Supreme Court of the United States for life who do not understand? The, a critical, basic, scientific fact of where we are. Does that scare me? Of course it does. I mean, yeah, we're in a situation where there is one side to where we are. Now, we can talk about what we should do about it. You might feel like we should do X, Y, Z, and I might feel like we should do, you know, ABC. And that's a fair conversation. But it is not a fair conversation in my mind for you to say, you know, there is no COVID pandemic. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, point taken. Point I guess taken. You can't, if you can't, if you can't accept the problem, how will you ever solve the problem? Tom, let me let me ask you, as somebody who's inside of the politics and the world of uh, finance, are you hopeful that we can reverse the impact of uh, climate change, given so much of a politics and and noise around it, and so much of a lobbying and and uh, big money going into it? Look, we're going to. We have to. We're going to. Americans will step up. I believe this, this election is a referendum on many things. 
but one of the basic, absolutely huge differences between the Biden-Harris ticket and the Trump-Pence ticket is a willingness to accept truth and science and deal with it. And climate change is an absolutely perfect example of it in the most important way. And so do I think we can do it? I know we can do it. And that, you know, there's a, the old Winston Church, Churchill statement, Americans always do the right thing after they try everything else. To me, Donald Trump was at the last stage of everything else. We don't have a choice. We have the technology to do it and we have to do it. And I believe that you're going to see on November 4th that Americans step up in a big way behind Joe Biden. They step up in a big way behind the people who want climate action. And that that is, we start to do exactly, you said three things. I think we're going to do those three things. I think we're going to succeed. I think we're going to actually do it faster, better, more thoroughly than people understand. And we're going to get the momentum and we're going to make it happen. Well, this note of uh, optimism also brings us to the end of this conversation. Tom Stair, thank you once more for your candid uh, insights and talking to the real news today. Aman, seriously, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks also to our audiences for tuning in. You can also uh, always look us up uh, at therealnews.com. But for myself and the rest of the team for now, it's uh, goodbye and be well.